I'd like to say from the outset, my only disclosure for this talk is that I'm the author of this book called The Obesity Paradox, and I have no other disclosures. But if any of you are interested in adding to my disclosure, just please go on obesityparadox.com or check out amazon.com or maybe head over to Barnes & Noble. And uh, I'd be glad for my conflict to increase. Well, this has been an important topic. Um, I was asked several years ago by Jack, which is our leading cardiovascular jur journal, to write a state of the art on obesity and cardiovascular diseases, including the obesity paradox. And you know, a lot of times when you have an original research article come out, there's a, especially if it's a new finding, you get a lot of press. Well, this was just a state of the art review. And after this came out in 2009, I probably did over 200 interviews in the next month and led to tens of thousands of write-ups in the press showing that this is a topic that's of substantial interest, not just to scientists and clinicians, but also to the, the lay public. And this paper, uh, by the way, I know it hasn't caught any of uh, Dr. Blair's papers so far, but it's almost up to, uh, to 900 citations in the literature. And then this past year, I took over as, as editor in January 2014 of the journal called Progress in Cardiovascular Diseases. And my first uh, issue was on this whole topic, if anyone's is interested, on obesity and cardiovascular diseases, not just the effects that obesity has on cardiovascular structure and function, but also uh, on prognosis, including the obesity paradox, and a pretty famous guy uh, in, in Canada, J.P. Desprace, was one of the authors of one of these uh, really, really good papers. And what I'm talking about today, we recently reviewed with Tim Church and Steve Blair uh, in an issue on exercise as medicine in U.S. endocrinology, and a lot of what I will discuss is in this paper. Well, to start off, I think there's a lot of controversy on what causes obesity in the, in the first place. And certainly, the press has really put a lot of the blame on the fast foods, McDonald's, Taco Bell, Burger King, and on the, the, the diet, including carbohydrates, the sugar, the sugary beverages, have all getting, gotten a lot of blame. Well, my colleagues and I really believe that the fundamental cause of obesity is the very dramatic decline that's occurred in physical activity over the last five decades. And this is a paper that Steve Blair and Tim Church and I all published together in PLOS One. It came out in February 2013, and it got a lot of publicity. And it wasn't all, and it was a, a study that assessed women's household management. First author was Ed Archer. Um, and so basically measuring housework that women did over five decades. And in one of the, the news clippings, it had a picture of me in the paper. And uh, next to it, it said, women are getting fat because they're not doing enough housework. <laughs> so you can imagine how well this went over on the home front. <laughs> Our paper was on Fox News three times in one night. And I don't know how many of you watch Fox News, but it's on all night at my house in New Orleans. Um, and we were on the Jay Leno uh, sitcom, you know, and, and my daughter was a medical student, came home and told me that my sister, who was a social worker in New Orleans, was very upset about my paper. <laughs> but basically, our paper showed that over five decades, there's been dramatic decline in the energy expenditure that women are doing in, in house. Basically, on the tune of 1,860 calories per week on average. Now, it's more complicated than this, but we typically use the term that about 100 calories are burned for every mile traveled by foot. Now, we've actually published papers that that's not so accurate, but that's still a good general way to think about it. That's the equivalent of basically walking or jogging 18 and a half more miles per week to make up now for the housework that wasn't being done as it was five decades before. Now, Tim Church, in a paper a year or two before that, looked at occupational physical activity. And unlike our paper that just looked at women, he looked at both women and men uh, occupations and basically showed, as you'd expect, over five decades, very dramatic declines 
in the, uh, in the physical activity. And when you look at what's happened to the occupational physical activity over five decades, and you looked at what's been the prevalence of obesity, it almost exactly tracked the increased uh, prevalence of obesity uh, correlated with the, uh, with the reduction in occupational physical activity. And in December 2013, Ed Archer and I and Steve Blair uh, assessed maternal physical activity. This first slide is in women with uh, older children above the age of five. Again, very marked increases in sedentary time and reductions in activity time. And it's even more marked in the women with younger children. Now, this may be important not only because it affects the weight of the women, but there's a lot of evidence that the hand who rocks the cradle rules the health of the next generation. So it may actually have an effect on the offspring. And then the fact that the greatest contributor of fitness, which I'm going to discuss and Dr. Blair discussed, is physical activity. So all of this makes a, a, a very significant tie-in. And again, both in the, in the women with, uh, with older children and even more so the women with young children, it adds up to about 15, 1,600 calories less per week that are being burned now compared to five decades ago. So in the setting of low physical activity, yes, it is important that one has to reduce the calories from all sources, including carbohydrate and sugar. But the fundamental cause of obesity and the weight gain that's occurred over time is not the calories or the, the fast foods or the sugary beverages. It's the very marked decline in physical activity. Now, there's also controversy on how much Obesity is playing uh, a role in decreasing the health and survival of our, of our nations. And this is data that uh, Catherine Flegel of the Center of Disease Control in the United States published in JAMA in January 2013. It's a meta-analysis of 97 studies of 2.9 million people with over 270,000 deaths, so a lot of statistical power. And they showed in this paper that relative to normal weight, the obese, if you count all the grades, the mild, the moderate, the severe, they had an increased mortality, statistically significant. But it was particularly the class two, which is BMI between 35 and 40, and class three, a severe obese, BMI is above 40, that carried all the weight, no pun intended, of the, of the increased mortality. Whereas grade one obesity, which is BMI between 30 and 35, was actually associated with a strong trend for lower mortality, a 5% lower mortality that was almost statistically significant. And the overweight BMI between 25 and 30 actually had a 6% statistically significant lower mortality than did those with the normal BMI between 18.5 and 25. And if you looked at the older people, BMI is above, uh, the age above 65, I think you might fall into that class, do you, Dr. Boy? What, by about 30 years? But uh, the older individuals actually had only a non-significant trend of 10% higher mortality, even with BMIs above 35. And that wasn't statistically significant, and there was no even trend with lower BMIs. So it really raises the question how much is particularly overweight and mild obesity playing to the adverse survival? Now, this just looked at survival. This didn't look at quality of life. This didn't look at arthritis. This didn't look at depression. This is just survival. And clearly, we know that there's substantial evidence that fitness is important. Uh, Dr. Church and I won this American Heart Association statement in circulation a couple of years ago showing how important fitness is and why we need a registry for fitness, and certainly numerous studies show a very strong relationship between measured fitness and subsequent survival. There was a big meta-analysis of studies by Kodama and JAMA about five years ago that basically showed for every one met metabolic equivalent change in fitness or exercise capacity, total cardiovascular disease events was affected by about 15% and cardiovascular and total mortality was affected by 13%, so an extremely strong finding. 
Uh, Dr. Blair showed this slide already about uh, close to 9,000 people and incidence rates of diabetes by going low to bottom 20 percentile, moderate to middle 40 percentile, and high to top 40 percentile, a very strong trend for lower development of, of diabetes with higher amounts of fitness. And Tim Church showed that even stronger findings in a very large study of 13,000 people, a very strong relationship between diabetes prevalence and increased fitness. And if you notice, the biggest bang for the bunk is not getting out into the super high levels of fitness, but it's moving one out of the lower levels of fitness into the next lower categories of fitness. Just a little bit improvement in fitness dramatically reduces the, uh, the, the incidence and prevalence of diabetes. Now, he showed this paper, too, in fitness and diabetes of 1,263 men, uh, followed for 12 years, it had 180, 180 deaths, and showed that men in the bottom 20 percentile of fitness had a 2.1-fold increased mortality uh, now, physical activity also played a role. One, the low physical activity was 1.7-fold. It shows that generally when studies assess both physical activity, and at least the old studies that assess physical activity were by questionnaire, so that's not as accurate, that fitness is a more precise measure and a much stronger finding. Maybe uh, if currently physical activity was measured more precisely, as Dr. Blair mentioned, with pedometers or smartphones, uh, Fitbits, uh, we might see a little bit different story, but still probably I would predict that fitness would be a stronger predictor. Tim Church data in 2,300 uh, men with diabetes, followed again for 16 years, had 179 cardiovascular deaths, showed that men with low cardiovascular fitness in the bottom 20 percentile, it didn't matter what they weighed because they had a close to three-fold increase in cardiovascular disease, disease mortality, whether their BMI was normal, overweight, or in the obese category, as shown here. And again, a very strong relationship, as Tim Church showed, between fitness and subsequent mortality. And again, you, you get a pro progressive reduction in mortality as you improve your fitness, but you get a very significant bang for the buck by just moving out of the lower categories into the next or the next uh, lowest categories of fitness. And again, when you combine fitness and the fatness uh, material, that the uh, fitness, regardless of your weight, appears much more significant than fatness. And many other landmark studies that Steve Blair has been involved with, from the Aerobic Center Longitudinal Study and elsewhere, have shown these same findings that fitness seems to be more important than fatness for predicting long-term outcomes. In my first issue of Progress in Cardiovascular Diseases, Steve Blair and one of his colleagues, Von Barry, did a meta-analysis of this. They, met, they analyzed 10 studies that were prospective and jointly measured both fitness and adiposity, or basically body mass index. And compared with the normal weight fit, the unfit, which was generally defined as the bottom 20 percentile or the bottom 30 percentile, had basically twice the all-cause mortality regardless of their BMI. And the overweight fit or the obese fit basically had similar survival as did the normal weight fit. So they concluded that fitness was more important than fatness for long-term mortality. Now clearly, the, the higher the weight is, as you start getting extremely high BMIs, it's going to be very hard to be fit. But there are a number of people in the overweight and mild obese categories who are more fit than the lean, and I know there have been some heavy people that have passed me in races for the last uh, 20 and 30 years, and it's humbling. <laughs> Both Dr. Blair and I have had the pleasure of working on a lot of papers with D.C. Lee, and one of them that we did a couple of years ago measured change in fitness and fatness in about 5,000 people. This, one, this is a paper in circulation, but another one that was published in Jack looked at change in fitness and fatness over time and the prediction of hypercholesterolemia, metabolic syndrome, and diabetes and basically showed that both increasing your weight over time 
or lowering your fitness over time were predictors of de de developing these adverse sequelae. But fitness was considerably more important than fatness for predicting these endpoints. And in this paper in circulation, in over 10,000 individuals who had assessments twice over time in fitness and, and BMI, he showed again that both BMI increasing and fitness falling were associated with increased cardiovascular disease mortality and all-cause mortality. But in this paper, he showed that once you assess the change in fitness, the change in fatness no longer had any statistical predictability. So again, fitness was, change in fitness was more important than fatness. So in a perfect world, everyone should remain lean and fit. But if you're going to give up one with aging, it's much better to gain some weight and to maintain your fitness. In this paper, he showed that for every one met change in fitness, there was a 19% change in major cardiovascular disease mortality and a 15% change in all-cause mortality. And again, many studies are showing that this uh, finding is, is actually much more important with aging, that there's a much more U-shaped relationship between survival and BMI at higher ages than, there, it, than it is at low ages. Now, with regard to diabetes, I know of five major studies now that have shown an obesity paradox. And I've actually published a lot on the obesity paradox in cardiovascular disease. I've shown it with coronary heart disease, heart failure, hypertension, atrial fibrillation. But these are five papers that looked at the obesity paradox in diabetics. And four of the studies showed a strong obesity paradox. The first one was by Carnitin and JAMA in 2000, 2012. The second one was by Logue and Diabetes Care in 2012. The third was by Zal in Circulation in 2014. And just a month ago, Costanzo showed it in, in Annals of Internal Medicine, meaning that in diabetics, the lean diabetics are having a worse prognosis than those who are overweight and mildly obese. And four of the five studies have shown this. The only one that didn't was the one by Tobias and colleagues in New England Journal of Medicine 2014 from the U.S. Nurses and U.S. Physicians Trial from the Harvard Group. Uh, and Dr. Blair at Church and I all published a letter to the editor criticizing uh, some aspects of this study. Uh, but certainly, not only did this study, but the other four, none of them assessed uh, adequately physical activity or cardiorespiratory fitness. Now, there was a big paper uh, in Jack by Bell and colleagues uh, several months ago that assessed uh, that, that the obese individuals who are metabolically healthy, meaning they didn't have diabetes, they had good sugars, good blood pressure, good lipids, over time, the obese developed more abnormalities. Well, we have a paper coming out next month discussing how the lack of fitness really affects this. And in a recent paper in Nature's Reviews in Endocrinology, uh, I reviewed the whole aspect of healthy obesity and the obesity paradox, and particularly how it's very important to tie in fitness, because without information on fitness, you really lose a lot of important information about obesity and prognosis. And again, the, the key is not just becoming fit, but trying to get people out of this low fitness category into the next lowest categories. You get the biggest bang for your buck by just seeing a little bit improvement in fitness. And as Tim Church showed, resistance training is also important, particularly as you age. We had a paper, one of Dr. Blair's uh, uh, fellows, Enrique Artero, a couple of years ago, showing how strong muscular strength is as a predictor of cardiovascular disease risk factors and all-cause survival. And so it's very important to combine uh, both the aerobic training and resistance training. And in one of our Heart D papers that one of uh, Tim Church's and, I, and my fellows, Dr. Neil Johansson, recently published in Diabetes Care, showed that the combination of aerobic training or aerobic training combined with resistance training both increased the exercise capacity by a, over a met and, and got over 20% improvement. Now keep this in mind, in the look ahead trial, at the end of four years, 
the difference between the intervention and the treatment arm was only 0.3 mets. So that's not much of an improvement in exercise capacity. So in conclusion, I think, and I think the, the, the data that Dr. Blair and Church uh, described as well really supports that physical fitness is an important component of health and overall health-related quality of life. Cardiorespiratory fitness may perhaps be the strongest cardiovascular risk factor. And in fact, people with hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, metabolic syndrome who are fit often have a better prognosis than individuals who don't have these disorders who are unfit. And although in a perfect world, everyone would remain lean and fit forever, uh, in the fit versus fat debate, fitness seems to be considerably more important than fatness, and this pertains to type 2 diabetes as well. And so certainly greater efforts are needed to assess and improve fitness in both endocrinology and certainly in all of our efforts in preventive cardiology. Thank you.